Usually I start my speech by talking about disruption and innovation. About turning disruption off and turning innovation on. And I use an example, let me use this one about self-driving cars because I've heard a lot of discussion about them here. We all know that they'll eliminate truck drivers, but what about insurance? It'll be impacted too, these cars don't crash. And parking, you'll probably send the vehicle home. And auto repair, most of them will be electric, they won't need to be repaired. And real estate will be redesigned because we won't need parking lots. And deliveries will be automated. And hotels, well, we'll probably say, honey, let's just stay in the car and keep driving. We don't need a hotel anymore. <laughs> and healthcare, the number one cause of emergency room visits is car accidents. That, that'll be changed dramatically. And billboards across the country, we're not going to be looking out the window anymore, so we won't see billboards. <laughs> and even police, who do you arrest in a self-driving car? <laughs> So all these industries will be disrupted by this one change. So it's not just about what's happening in your industry. It's about what's happening upstream and downstream from you that can change and disrupt you. And that's why I speak on innovation. I've written a book about it. But you know, they asked me when I came here today not to give my normal speech, but to talk about me and my journey. So I started as a travel agent, I've been a product marketer, I've been a CIO, I've been a CEO, I've been a chairman. I've served on 14 boards, I've been a venture capitalist, an author, and a speaker. I've had many careers. And they asked me to focus in particularly about building Travelocity and building Kayak. And then there was a little note in the thing they sent me that said, you know, have you retired? And, and have you stopped? Well, this was in a recent IBM annual report. It said I was operating at full throttle. Uh, and I still am. Uh, I have a new startup. Uh, so at 69 years old, I'm trying to do it again uh, because it's so much fun. So was I born a businessman? Did I start that way? No, but I'd like to credit my mom, who at a very early age took me to the library before I even went to school. And I started reading, and I'm a voracious reader. And because my father was in advertising, we had 30 magazines that came to the house every month. And I read all of them, from Successful Farming to Life magazine. <laughs> and it made me curious. And curiosity is extremely important if you're going to be an entrepreneur. You have to be curious, learning new things all the time. And my dad taught me to build things. We built a go-kart together. And because he was in amateur radio, we built radios together. And I love to build new things. So I thank my parents a lot. And then when I was nine years old, they sent me away to camp in Canada for two months every summer. I had no idea how challenging it would be. I had to carry heavy loads through the woods and learn how to deal with bugs and rain. And I loved it. I loved it. I went back for 12 summers. It taught me about adventure and risk and helped me learn tenacity and a lot about teamwork. So a lot of my past prepared me for the future. And then when I graduated from college, I thought I was going to travel, but not the way I'd hoped. It looked like I was going to fight in Vietnam because I was drafted by the army. But I'm blind in one eye, so they didn't take me after all, but I still traveled. My college roommate had a free pass on Transworld Airlines, some of you remember them, uh, because his father was a pilot, and he said, I'm going to spend a year going around the world. So two of us went with him, we spent a year traveling around the world, the best postgraduate course I could have had. I got to stoke my lust for adventure. I learned by being in other cultures, there's more than one right answer. I learned patience and how to listen in many languages. And I learned that I had to take risks to get where you want to go. So that's kind of what formed me. And I learned that I love to travel, and I still do. So what qualities became most important in leadership? I think the most important one has to do with risk. 
You see, in the 21st century, you can't avoid it, you can't reduce it, you can't transfer it. You must accept risk. Now, I started my career as a receptionist in a travel agency almost 50 years ago. Six months in, my manager said, let's go do a startup. So I left to do my first startup, and you might think that was a big risk, but really it was a small risk. I was 21, I was single, I lived in an apartment, I wasn't making much money anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and we ended up building the 50th largest travel company in the United States. And then I jumped to my second startup, and that was selling mini computers to travel agents. Six months in, that company was sold to American Airlines. Suddenly I was inside a big company and I was moving up the ladder, and one day my boss, Max Hopper, the CIO, said, I want you to become vice president of software development. I said, but Max, I'm not a programmer. I've never managed them. He said, don't worry, you'll do fine. Suddenly I was in charge of 500 programmers. <laughs> I had no idea what to do. What could I bring them? Well, I went back and thought about my early life, and believe it or not, I started a book club. And my seven managers and I read a different book every month because they were geniuses when it came to programming, but they didn't understand business at all. So I learned I could, I could teach them business. And we focused on quality, and I taught them about Deming and about how quality was being managed in making cars and manufacturing, and it hadn't been done in software. So that was the lesson that I could give them together. And then Max called me again. He said, I want you to become VP of computer operations. And I said, I don't know anything about computer operations. He said, you'll do fine. <laughs> Suddenly, I was running the largest data center in the world. Handled American Airlines, 40 other airlines, and 40,000 travel agents. I lost my hair doing that job. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem was that right at that time, Sabre was spun out of American Airlines and went public. So I started listening. And of course, my bosses wanted more revenue and new products. But my customers said lower costs and increase uptime. And those were conflicting goals. It's very hard to lower costs and increase uptime and have new products and new revenue. It's just a difficult thing to do. So I had to blow up the silos between departments. And for the first time, we set interlocking goals and we were one team making the tension between all those three goals work to produce the result the customers and my bosses wanted. And I went back to where I was at camp. You see, we were all in the same canoe. For the first time, we were working together for one goal. Now, then I was made Chief Information Officer at American. And after a few years of being CIO, it took a huge risk. I was married, I had two kids, I had a big salary and a big mortgage. And I, you know, I'd run product marketing, product development, computer operations, the division. I'd been in two startups. And I said, you know, that little department we have, Easy Saber, that's our first online venture, I want to go do that and not be CIO. And they said, well, that's pretty crazy. And I said, no, I want to do it. And we turned it into Travelocity.com and later took it public for $1.2 billion. So big risk, big reward, right? Since then, I've taken a lot of small risks. I've been on 14 public and private boards. And as I look back, some of those companies shrank, some of them flamed out entirely, and the rest of them created over $6 billion of value. Two of them were unicorns. If you don't take risk, you don't move forward. Now I'm all in again with my time and my treasure. I have a new startup called Wayblazer. And people say to me, Terry, do you have to do another startup? I say, no, I'm on a government pension. <laughs> I'm old, I don't have to do another startup. I want to do another startup. It's fun. You can change the world if you take the first risk. But you have to take risk, and there will be failure. If you don't fail, you're not moving forward. You're not experimenting enough. We allow failure and harvest learning, says Intuit. We allow failure and harvest learning. Early on at Travelocity, we put together a CD-ROM with videos on it because in those days, you couldn't send video over the internet. Do you remember? <laughs> it 
was slow. <laughs> so I spent a million dollars building the product and getting it on the shelves. And I lost a million dollars. It was a total abject failure. And I had to go to my boss, the CFO at American Airlines, and say, I lost a million dollars. I was terrified. You know what he said? He said, Terry, what did you learn? Well, the word spread like wildfire. Terry didn't get fired, right? <laughs> but also that he was a coach. And coaches don't just throw people off the team. They work to make the team better. Now, I knew I couldn't learn, lose a million bucks again, but he changed the way we thought about risk in doing that. You see, coaches watch this mistake over and over again, not to assess blame, but to ensure victory. We have to learn from our failures and move forward. Don't write, we will never change in the concrete outside your building. Write, we experiment in the sand to let the water come wash it away and write it again and again. Fail often to succeed sooner. Accept risk, accept failure. And lots of you are taking pictures and that's fine, but I will show you where to get these slides at the end. Now, safety. Safety first is the job of a leader. You see, you can get people to do anything. You can have employees who are shot out of a cannon as long as they have a net. <laughs> they have to have a net. And as a leader, it's your job to provide the net. With a net, they'll be fearless. In order to do it, you have to eliminate the bozone layer. Now, we're not talking about global warming, the ozone layer. This is the layer of bozos, okay? <laughs> This is the impenetrable layer that stops good ideas from flowing upward. It's made up of middle managers. It's not their fault. They are not rewarded for change. It's easier to say no. So as a leader, you have to reach down through the bozone layer and say, this is Sally's idea. We're going with it. And this is Larry's idea. And by the way, it failed. And Larry's getting a promotion. And as soon as you do that, the bozone layer will go away. As soon as you kill projects, not people. Kill projects, not people. And you will find the response is amazing. They will try and try again if they know you've got their back. Because the best ideas come from the bottom. They come from the salesperson, the person in operations, the person out on the line. In 1996, we started paging people at Travelocity when flights were late. That idea came from a customer service agent who got tired of answering the phone and said, can't we page him? I said, yeah. We started sending emails to people when the price fell. Nobody had ever done that before. That idea came from a programmer. The best ideas come from the bottom. You see, innovation that happens from the top down is orderly, but dumb. <laughs> and innovation that happens from the bottom up is chaotic and smart. So we have to find a way to listen to everybody. That doesn't eliminate being autocratic. <laughs> An autocratic leader can listen and must listen. It's top down first, set the tone to get bottom up later. Set the tone of safety, make them sure you're listening, and you will hear amazing things. This is World War I radar. They didn't have radar, so they had these big earphones, right? <laughs> we all need them. <laughs> At Travelocity.com, we had a phone booth in the hall. It was a symbol. When you picked up the phone, you listened to customer service. And everybody in the company, from the guy in the mailroom to me, had to listen to two calls by customers every month. And a staff meeting discussed, one, did we fix the defect in the company that made the customer call? And two, what amazing new ideas have you heard from customers this month? It involved everybody in the company and the customer's pain. And that's very important in the indirect businesses we run today. Now, at kayak.com, we don't have a phone bank. We're a search company. But Paul English, our CTO, said, we'll take emails. And we send the emails to the engineers, to the programmers. And you might think, well, that's crazy. Programmers make a lot of money. But our slogan is, give the pain to the people who cause the pain. <laughs> and it works. They are nimble, responsive, and they know exactly what's going on in the business. Otherwise, they wouldn't. 
General Dynamics recently introduced a crowdsourcing program. We were talking about crowdsourcing last night, getting ideas from all over the world. Amazingly, 50% of their approved ideas came from their own employees. They didn't have to crowdsource, they just had to listen. They didn't have a vehicle for it before, and now they said, hey, we've got a pretty good crowd right here. <laughs> Let's listen to them. If you do that, your product can become clay in the customer's hands. Kayak has the number one mobile app in the world for travel. 55 million people have downloaded it. But when we started, we thought it was about next flight. He told me he didn't believe in Travelocity, he believed in you. And that's how I got around the Bozone layer, because he trusted me. Mm. So you do need somebody uh, for air cover and somebody who... Oh, you have to have somebody for air cover. I mean, it, look, if, if the top of the organization is totally opposed, and you try and try, I would just leave and go somewhere else because they're not going to change. Makes sense. The, you know, and sometimes you go and, and you have a great idea that you propose to change something, and that was the idea that got your boss his job in the first place. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So, one last one. Clearly, I mean, this was a remarkable journey that you shared with us, and thanks for doing that. But it, it wasn't always smooth sailing. No. There must have been many, many occasions. You talked a lot about failure, which yeah. is great. There must be many times that you were kind of feeling down and out. Oh. How did you pick yourself up each time that happened? Well, I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm a positive kind of a person, and uh, I really believed in the idea. And sometimes we guessed wrong. I mean, look, we were the biggest in the world, and Expedia passed us. That was terribly depressing. But we still had a billion-dollar company. It wasn't the end of the world. And we thought, well, maybe we can pass them again. Um, and we got close. Uh, so, you know, it, you make decisions quickly. We ju they jumped on hotels. We jumped on cruises. They were right, but they were also lucky, you know. And you have to understand the luck factor in business and just say, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Uh, because we're building a great business here for people, and we are changing the world, and we did. Most people don't know, travel is the largest part of e-commerce. It's larger than the next three categories combined. So it's a massive market, and, and we changed it together. Fantastic. Sounds like it's, uh, it's a question of keeping that positive mindset and keep going on living. It, it really is. I mean, yeah, look, it, failure is tough. Uh, it hurts. And I don't know if this new startup is going to work. I hope so. I'm going out to see investors tomorrow. I'm going to convince them it's going to work. Um, but you don't know. And uh, that's okay. You know, look, look at sports teams. They don't know they're going to win every game, and they don't win every game. They don't. And a world-class baseball player fails 70% of the time. If you bat 300, you're awesome, right? They just get a lot of chances. So give yourself a lot of chances, and you'll do fine. Very good. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. Uh, questions before we bring everything to a close for Terry? Late in the day, so. I there we have a question. Them. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Terry, for sharing this phenomenal journey with you. It's uh, with us. It was truly inspiring. I just have one question for you, and it'll be good for us to understand what was your chairman's, which is your leader's, reaction when uh, he was signing the first check for Travelocity, and when did the financials come into the conversation? after you formulated your organization? Well, you know, he understood. Um, this was a guy that would take risk. And that, that, that was, he was all about risk. I mean, building a saber system was a huge risk. Um, doing this was a huge risk. Um, he knew we would lose money. Uh, he knew we'd lose money for a while. Um, luckily, we were, you know, losing the hundreds of thousands. He was running a multi-billion dollar organization. So, uh, to him, it was a small risk. And his attitude, which was the best I ever saw, when we would do things like this and somebody internally would say, well, that isn't our business, he said, we know how to do it and somebody else is going to do it anyway. Let's us do it and make that money. And that was a wonderful attitude, that somebody else is going to do it. It fits our model. Let's do it ourselves. So uh, he's the best boss I could have had. Now, he's a very tough, autocratic, mercurial guy. Um, tough to work for, but... I'm immensely loyal to him because he was super supportive. Thank you. Thanks. Anything else? Looks like, that Looks is. like we're done. All right. Thank, thank you. you.